So I'm going to call today's message from in-house to outpost. I've used the word outpost quite a bit here lately. Um, it's something that the Holy Spirit has been really circulating in my spirit for months and months, really over a year. And when I'm, when I'm praying, when I'm thinking about the trajectory of this assembly, what God has done in 39 to 40 years of history at this assembly, and then especially what's been happening more recently, indicative of a new move of the Spirit here, and God exchanging what was former for what is future. And really, your leadership here, elders and staff and fivefold leaders here, on our face, seeking the Lord, fasting and praying, just so we can hear, just, Lord, help us, guide our steps, let us walk the right pathway. And for over um, a year, almost a year and a half, we have been spending every Tuesday night in this room, almost every Tuesday night, and many fasting, all of us praying, I think at certain occasions about... Um, 60, 75 people in here on Tuesday nights between the hours of 4 and 8 p.m. And you can come anytime during those hours if you ever want to stop by. But the purpose is not just so we can say we have a prayer meeting. It's very intentional. It's like, Lord, we want to know what you're saying and we want to see what you're doing so we can um, attach ourselves to what you're doing, what you're saying. How many of you know by now too many churches come up with their own agenda, Right. And it kind of oddly, ironically, looks just like the other church down the street. And that was modeled after the biggest church in the county. And so there's a lot of formulas and there's a lot of things that prop up churches. And we're living in a season prophetically where the propped up stuff isn't going to work. And I'm not casting stones or anything. I'm not, I'm not speaking death over any church. I want every church to get on their face, seek the Lord, be just ambushed by the Holy Spirit. Let the fire of God come. Let the wind of the Spirit blow. I want to see every church explode. I don't have a single shred of competition or jealousy in my heart, but I do know this, that church as usual just is not going to work anymore. I think there was a season where the Lord maybe wasn't necessarily pleased with it, but in his grace, he chose to bless it. But I think now that there is a shift in the kingdom here as it's manifesting in America, that the Lord is not saying any longer, I'm willing to keep propped up ministries propped up. That I believe he's going to pull the props out and based on the response of those churches, hopefully when the props are pulled out, they'll say, oh God, help us. What do we do? But some people just build new props. And I believe that if we're going to be the church that God's called us to be, we have to understand the assignment and we have to say yes daily. And it's not going to be easy in certain parts because we are creatures of comfort. We like cozy church, easy church, fun church, dare I say it, me-centered church. I want the programs to be right for me, for my kids, for my youth, for my schedule, for my preferences. And the Lord will probably end up saying to many people, hey, there's lots of churches that'll do that for you, but not this one. Because we are a prophetic group of people moving into an apostolic mandate. And I know that's a lot of language right now, but if you'll pay attention during this series and the things that are coming, you'll understand better. So we're going to go into a message called From In-House to Outpost, and I want to begin to kind of season our flavor or flavor our our thinking uh, again from the church at Antioch in the book of Acts. So look with me in Acts 13, I'm going to read five verses. In Acts 13, verse 1, it says, there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, and they're named here, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, and you know Saul better as the Apostle Paul, same man. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. You know, it's a little risky for 
me to go through what's basically a historical narrative, five historical verses that don't on the surface seem to have a lot of fuel on them. But they're so important as we are walking through this series teaching about the church at Antioch. And the reason why is because when I've been studying the church of Antioch for years now, but especially in this season, I'm asking the Lord, show me what it was about them that needs to be translated here. And there's so many major components, probably at least seven or eight major components, and I want to touch on a little bit of them today. Some of it has to do with their leadership. Some of it has to do with the culture and the diversity within that church. But a lot of it today is going to be about consecration and spiritual discernment. And what does it mean for us as a faith family to press in to know the Lord, not only who he is, but what he wants done? So let's start with some very, very basic points that in the church at Antioch, the home base, that's Antioch, the leadership there was diverse. Now, I know that that can evoke a yawn, but I think it's very important that we recognize something. Matter of fact, just take a look around the room. Lots of different shades of skin in here. Lots of different ages. Lots of different backgrounds represented. Racial diversity is beautiful. If you don't like racial diversity, please don't go to heaven. Because it's not going to be just you and your, your folks. It's one of the beauties is every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every generation. God likes that. And so if you live in a racially diverse community, your church should be a reflection of that. And here in Antioch, it's even more uh, apparent when you break down just the names of these leaders. And again, you had prophets and teachers, and they're named Barnabas, Simeon, uh, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and then you had Saul. So you've got these five primary leaders that are mentioned here. And I want to start off by saying this, they all had unique leadership giftings. It wasn't a one-man show. Our models of church today are primarily hierarchical. You got one, typically a male at the top of the hierarchy. He's almost always called the pastor. And then you have some staff under him. And then you have a bulk of people that in many churches, forgive me if this sounds critical, you have a bulk of people that pay their admission via the tithe. They come into a very well-presented atmosphere. They listen to the professionals do the music. And then they listen to the guy that gets the paycheck say some things about God. And then they leave and they make friendships. And it's not like horrible, but it certainly isn't what God has designed. And especially when you come to this issue of one person leading an assembly. I'm going to give you something because this will be new teaching for some of you. Nowhere in scripture... Was there supposed to be an established house of worship or community of believers, typically meeting in house churches, where one person was in charge? That's just not God's pattern. It never was. That actually came from a Roman system of civil government that was imported into the church. And so what we've got today is not necessarily something that needs to be thrown away, but we have something that must be reformed if we're ever going to be able to say, God, we're doing it your way. And so what we have here in the church there at Antioch, you had prophets and teachers, and it's a good time for me just to season you with, again, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Remember these verses. This is what's commonly referred to as five-fold ministry. It's God's design for church, for the big C church. And where possible, all little c local churches. It says that Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Again, Jesus gave to the church who? Apostles. Whom? Prophets. Whom? The evangelists. Whom? The shepherds or the pastors. And then the teachers. Five offices. What was the purpose? To equip everybody for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ might be built up. Now, we could stay there the rest of the day. Just leave that up there for a moment. But we could stay there the rest of the day because this is not how people do church anymore. That literally God's design was that five different types of leaders would be at work in the church to train the much more broader amount of people that weren't necessarily holding leadership offices. They had spiritual gifts, but they were to be trained and equipped to carry out the majority of the ministry. 
So you see automatically how different that is from the paradigm that we have today. The paradigm we have today is, no, we don't do ministry. That's what we pay you for. And is there any wonder why the glory of God is not emanating like it could from the church? Is it any wonder why people are frustrated with their supposed super pastor? And the pastors quit, rank and file just quit after a few years because they're expected to be, well, let me just show you what apostles and all of these offices do. These are very simplified terms. When we talk about apostles, those are the ones who start up. Those are the ones that start up. When it comes to prophets, those are typically ones that speak up, okay? The prophets are those that speak up. The evangelists raise up. They go to spiritually dead people, speak life unto them through the gospel, and those people are raised up. The shepherds, they show up. Those are your pastors. When you're sick, they show up. When you're hurting, they show up. When it's time to celebrate, they show up. When you have a need, they show up. Why? Because true shepherds smell like sheep because they're always with them. They show up. And teachers, they train up. They're going to tell you the right way that things need to be done. Now, could you imagine a church trying to find in one individual, let's just give it a little bit of grace, a little latitude, three individuals, that their sole job for everybody is to start up, speak up, raise up, show up, and train up. And when that kind of pressure is placed on one individual, when God hasn't given any one individual all of those graces at a high level, that's why church doesn't always work. That's why people get frustrated because evangelistic people want the pastor to be an evangelist. Apostolic people want to go, what's next? We want a pastor who's apostolic. You know, people that have low value teaching, they just want him to parse the Greek and share the Hebrew and go through the covenants and all of the dispensations and so on. And then you, you, some people just, they don't care what happens on the platform. They just want to have the pastor hold their hand through all of the things of life. And it's not working. It hasn't been working for a very, very long time. So that's why here at this assembly, and if you're visiting here today, it's a great series for you to come and join us with because we're laying some foundations about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we are a five-fold church. That means we have five distinct columns of ministry here, and they are overlapping and they do intertwine, but we have apostolic ministry here. We have prophetic ministry here. We have evangelistic ministry here. We have shepherding or pastoring ministry, and we have teaching ministry. And all of these are headed up by people that God spotlighted, and they're building teams underneath them. Why? So we can both care for the flock and equip the flock for the day in which we're living and the things that are coming down the pike. Now, back to these leaders. So that some of them were prophets, some of them were teachers, some of them may have been both, but these five that are listed, I think it's important to take a glance at all of them. You have the first one, his name's Barnabas. Uh, I affectionately call him Barney from time to time. Barnabas was a Jewish man, but he was a native of Cyprus. So he was Jewish, but he wasn't from Jerusalem. So he would have been a little bit more liberated than your typical Jew from Jerusalem. He was a generous landowner. He had received Jesus as Messiah, donated the proceeds from a land sale, and his actual name was Joseph, but they called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, because wherever he went, he helped people, he encouraged people, he lightened loads. So Barnabas was the guy. He, he would later be called an apostle, a sent one. He, he was the guy that came out of the church at Jerusalem. Remember I told you that last time I preached in the series. I told you that Barnabas was the guy that the church in Jerusalem said, go figure out what's going on at Antioch with all of these non-kosher people getting saved and receiving Jesus. So Barnabas goes up and the Bible says that he saw the grace of God. People that you wouldn't have thought came into the kingdom were coming into the kingdom. Gentiles, people who didn't value Sabbath rules and dietary regulations and circumcision and all of the law. They had no regard for it, and yet the Holy Spirit had fallen on them just like he had done the Jews. And so the people sent Barnabas up. Barnabas says, this is amazing, but it's too much. People are getting saved. I need some help. And so he went and got Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who we more familiar, uh, familiarly know as the Apostle Paul. So Barnabas was a guy there. I just picture him as like a big, encouraging, kind of a, um, a solid, dedicated believer. Then you have a man that we don't know much about. His name is Simeon, and he was called Niger. And so Simeon was a Jewish man in religion, but the word Niger means black, and he was likely a black man in ethnicity. 
And so many scholars actually believe that this Simeon was the same guy talked about in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, who was Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross of Jesus. And so you have this potential. I personally agree with that view. I believe it was probably him. So here you have a Hellenistic Jew and you have a black man who is Jewish, but he is from probably Cyrene and Lucius of Cyrene is named and we have no doubt where he came from. It's the northern part of Africa. And he is probably a convert of Simeon, also from Cyrene. So Simeon carries the cross, sees Jesus die, goes back home, hears the gospel. Maybe he was still in town for Pentecost when when the Holy Spirit exploded. But he goes back to his hometown potentially and leads this man Lucius of Cyrene and they end up in Antioch there. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of those were accurate points? There is conjecture there. But my thought is Simeon gets saved, goes back to Cyrene and leads Lucius of Cyrene and now they're both ministering together as either a prophet or a teacher in the church of Antioch. Well, listen, the diversity gets even more because the fourth guy is a guy named Manan, and he is described as a foster brother of Herod Antipas, a very, very wicked man. They grew up together, childhood friend, raised up. Manan would have been raised up in privilege. He would have been raised up, connected and insulated from all of the life difficulties because he's in with Herod's family. And yet his boyfriend, his boy, boyhood friend w- w- grows up and ends up decapitating John the Baptist, ends up rejecting Christ, mocking him, and ultimately Herod Antipas dies in his sins. What a different path his foster brother took. A path of self-denial, a path of sacrifice, a path of submission to Jesus Christ in the midst of all of the privilege he grew up with. He said, nothing's more important than this Messiah named Jesus. And then ultimately you have Saul. Saul, a well-educated Hebrew scholar, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a former persecutor of the church, theologically brilliant, pedigreed, radically saved via a supernatural encounter with the resurrected Christ and handpicked to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Here's what's interesting. If you go back into, um, I believe, chapter number 11. Let me see if I wrote that down. I think it's chapter, no, yeah, it's chapter number 11, verse 19. What's interesting is chapter 11 of Acts, verse 19, tells you that the church of Antioch began when Christians were scattered there because of the persecution that followed the martyrdom of Stephen. Do you remember who stood there and authorized the martyrdom of Stephen, the first Christian? Saul, and now he's a leader in that church. Somebody say hashtag grace. (laughs) That the man whose persecution, Saul, facilitated the Christians fleeing to Antioch where they became a church. Now, many years later, that same man now converted, saved by grace, spirit-filled, called to be an apostle, ends up being one of the primary leaders in the very church. Let me just go ahead and say this pastorally. Don't you dare write anybody off. Don't you dare look at anybody who says they'll never be anything for the kingdom. Don't look at yourself in the mirror and say, because of my failures, I can never be anything from God. You got to recognize that the grace of God is the strongest active force in the universe. And God can take what you were and what somebody else currently is, and he can radically flip that thing for his purposes and his glory. And the church at Antioch, you talk about faith because some of those people in that church would have been thinking, I'm in this church because you ran me out of my hometown however many years ago. But welcome. Welcome, Brother Saul. Welcome, because the same blood that cleansed me is the same blood that cleansed you. Uh, May God purge his church of arrogance, division. And I can say this. Here's a big $4 word, homogeny. When I use the word homogeny, it means don't be a part of a church where everybody's got to look and act and, and appear the same way on the outside. Quenches the spirit. That's the spirit of religion. 
Listen, we all have to be under the same harness moving in the same direction, but we don't lose how God has created us individually. Our gifts are different. Our background is different. There are, listen, our lifestyles have been different. Or we're different generations, men and women, extroverts and introverts. We're very, very different. And the beauty of the gospel is when people say, it's not about me being all me all the time. How can I take who I am and merge it with others that are different than me? Instead of standing there and waiting for everybody to merge with who you are. Didn't have that in my notes, but felt like it might need to be said. Verse number two. <laughs> that was one verse. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's okay. It's a short message today. Um, second point is in this church, they were consecrated and discerning. Consecrated and discerning. It says there in verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, it's an interesting Greek word translated here in the English Standard Version as worshiping. It's mentioned in other translations as ministering unto the Lord. It's actually the same thing. It's a word that means they were actually intentionally in some form of liturgy, ministering and worshiping unto the Lord. And while they were doing that, they were fasting. And it was during that fasting and ministering unto the Lord that the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I've called them. Um, A couple of points that I'd like to share with you just from that verse. First of all, notice that when the Holy Spirit wanted to pick somebody for leadership and for a mission, he chose people that were already engaged. They were ministering unto the Lord. They were worshiping. They were fasting. The book of Acts chapter number six tells us that the primary responsibility and duties of Christian kingdom leaders, especially when you're talking about apostles, when you're talking about prophets, when you're talking about um, even teachers to a certain extent, that the high call is intimacy, it's presence, get in the presence of God. Stay there. Some people won't like this, and this, again, is part of the problem with the church. Some people get offended or jealous or upset when the leader is not available constantly to meet with them because he or she is in the place of prayer. And that just shows you where we are as a church today. Get out of the place of prayer. I want to have lunch. Get, Get out of the place of the word, the studying of the word, because, listen, I want you to do this and this, and frankly... If we're going to be the kind of ministry that God has called us to be, the kind of faith family, we need our leaders to be on their faces with their noses in the Bible so they can hear from the Lord, so they can equip others to be able to do the work of the ministry. Now, it's just not popular these days because, again, we live in the day with, well, you get a paycheck, so you're here to meet my needs. And, of course, I don't get this from this house just in case you think I'm, like, throwing punches in the pulpit. That is not the case in this house. I don't get any pressure, nor do our other leaders. But it is something that I want those of you that aren't a part of this house to recognize when you go back to that place where you have leaders. The best thing for your leaders is to be in the presence of God and coming out from the presence of God. They minister as they can. So, that went over like a porcupine in a punch bowl, but we'll just keep going. It was during that time where the Holy Spirit said, I like that verse, by the way, because the Holy Spirit's not an it. It's not a force. He's the third person of the Godhead. He's still talking today. And the Holy Spirit said to fasting, consecrated leaders, now set apart for me. And he names two people. He names Barnabas and he names Saul. He says, I've got work for them to do. One of the things, and I'll hit on this in a couple of weeks, Lord willing, uh, one of the things that in order to be the the type of church that is defined by the New Testament, we have to be a sending church. An apostolic church identifies people as the Holy Spirit speaks, raises up and equips those people, and is always willing to send forth those people. In this case, Barnabas and Saul were probably their top two leaders. And the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to take Barnabas and Saul, they're, they're, they're clearly more known than the other three men there. I want to take Barnabas and Saul and I'm going to bring them out of the home base and I'm going to send them on a mission. Now it takes a lot of faith for a local assembly. It has to come to the place where all churches recognize that nobody's indispensable. The only one that's indispensable is Jesus. All leaders, and we should value and honor and love and support and pray for our leaders, but at any time we have to recognize they're not ours. They're his. 
And at any moment, the one who saved them and owns them and gifted them and can, can release them to go and do a work. But we're a little territorial because we, we're addicted to personalities. We, listen, Paul, it's nothing new. You say, yeah, this is a new phenomenon. No, it's not. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in chapter number one. And he said, hey, listen, some of y'all say you're, you're part of Peter's crew. You guys over here, y'all like to rally around Apollo. Some of you have been saying you're part of my crew. I don't want a crew. And then some of you take the high road and you're Jesus only and you don't respect any leader. And what Paul says is, hey, ultimately, we need to value our leaders. We need to honor them. But they are people that work for the Lord. But it is the Lord who is over the entire harvest. And so when they were getting these words from the Lord, I, I, I want to highlight it was during a time of intentional fasting and praying. And it wasn't a day, it was a season. So they're ministering unto the Lord. They're worshiping the Lord. They're doing what they're doing for the Lord. And it was during that time that the Lord begins to say, Barnabas and Saul, I want you. I'm calling you into something. Let me give you a couple of other verses because discernment is critical in this day. Proverbs chapter 8. It's really a chapter where wisdom is speaking, but it's actually words that can be applied to Jesus himself. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Like, seek me diligently. That means when we want to know the will of God as a corporate body, or you want to know the will of God as a believer, sometimes God will literally withhold from you what he could give you immediately. He'll say, I want you to press into me. I don't want you to shout from a distance that you need an answer and me shout back, here it is. Because God is not transactional primarily. He's relational. And he's saying, I want you to press in, seek me, seek me. That means there's times where he's more important than food, more important than social media, more important than family night out, more important than entertainment. There are times where, the, by the way, he's always more important than those things, but there are times where he says, I want you all to myself during the season because you need to hear me. So we fast and we pray. And by the way, again, plugging Tuesday nights, that's what it's all about. Tuesday night is not a super cool ministry here. It's a bunch of Christians gathering together. And beginning this Tuesday night, we're going to break it into three segments uh, between 6 and about 7.30 about seven thirty uh, at night. You can come at 4 o'clock. From 4 to about 6 o'clock, just come and pray. Come and pray. But around 6 o'clock, we're going to start focusing on three different segments. I'll lead one. Tammy Southerner will lead one. And Roger Henry will lead one. And we're going to go and press into the Lord specifically, saying we need understanding. We need your heart in these areas. So consecration doesn't always feel cool. It's not always super entertaining. That's why so few people do it, because it, we live in such a casual, see it and grab it kind of, uh, kind of church uh, generation that that idea of seeking him diligently just doesn't appeal to a generation, can I say it, of lazy Christians who would rather go to a, you know, a 45-minute worship conference than, than to just sit in the presence of God and wait for him to speak. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 14, famous verses. God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God says, I got great plans for my people. And then verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Verse 13, here's a kingdom key. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. So again, this is what we're talking about, consecration. Consecration is not really about what you wear. It's, it's not like these and thou's in King James English. Consecration isn't simply moral. There is clearly moral implication. Consecration is, is, is it's the attitude of a person's life when they're convinced they can't go one more moment without God. And they don't want to. Like the more you consecrate yourself, the more you're like saying, why did I wait so long? Why was I such a casual Christian? Why was I nom a nominal churchgoer? Why was I on the periphery? Why did I embrace status quo? Why did I think it was okay to be a C plus Christian? And when you press in, you're like, oh, this doesn't feel like a ball and chain. This feels like super turbocharged rockets in my spirit launching into new places with the Lord. But it never happens throughout, without consecration, friends. Um, 
I have so many little tangents I can go on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to discipline myself. I would, I would say this. If, if you want to be a leader in this house, but you don't want to live consecrated and you don't want to pray, then it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. If you want to lead up here on the platform, but your life is compromised, God will expose that, and it's just not going to work. It doesn't mean we won't love you and help you. It just means you're not fit to lead if your life is compromised. And, and, and so, like, people are hungry for platform ministry. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't sanctify anybody. This does not sanctify anybody. It reveals whether or not you are sanctified. And, and yet we live in a day where people are just like, give me a microphone. I got something to say. I got something to sing. I got something to preach. I got something to teach. And our job as leaders is like, man, are you examining your heart? Because we're like, we're like getting serious about our hearts. And if we're going to have the power of God fall in this house, it's not just about the people on the platform. Everybody. 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 Like, literally, if everybody was in their lives where you are in your life with sanctification, could the glory fall? Tough questions, but these are the kind of questions that a church that is refusing status quo Christianity has to ask and answer. And again, my guess is, is this is not going to be the biggest church because people that want it easy and sweet and syrupy and put some sprinkles on that bad boy, Jeff. Come on, make it, make it taste good. We like our cotton candy and we like it warm. Um, it's, it's just... It's just not what we're going to do. Now, I'm not looking to drive anybody off, but I, one of my values is be honest. Amen. Just be honest with people. I respect you too much to try to lure you in by scratching your ears, by patting you on the head, by pretending we're going to be something other than we're going to be. And even if I was inclined to do that, I'm going to tell you the time's too short for that kind of nonsense. Amen. So... Consecrated and discerning Christians back in the day at Antioch heard the Holy Spirit say, Barnabas, Saul, you guys step away from the other three right now. I've got some work for you. So go down into verse number three. They proactively worked to advance the kingdom. It says, after fasting and praying, and you could put in parentheses there, some more because they were already fasting and praying. And so when the Holy Spirit said, these two guys, what did they do? They didn't leap into action. They kept fasting and praying because they knew who, but they didn't know what. They fasted and prayed and the Holy Spirit said, who? These two guys. Now, a lot of us be like, great, let's do something for God. But a consecrated church will say, okay, we know who. Let's fast and pray and maybe he'll tell us what. And it's so important that we have the right people doing the right things. It's so important that you as a follower of Jesus are not spending 80% of your life's energy investing into something that God actually didn't equip you for or call you to. And listen, if you're taking up a spot that you shouldn't be, it means somebody else should be in that spot and they're not in their spot. And it also means there's a spot for you because you're in a spot you shouldn't be in that you're not filling. And one of the greatest joys in the Christian life is when that born-again woman, that born-again man, that born-again young person comes to the place that they not only know who he is, but they find out who they are. It sounds a little Dr. Phillish, but y'all just bear with me here. Like, one of the most important things to human nature is to know who you are and why you are. And a lot of people in our churches don't know either. I'll tell you who I am. I'm not, I'm not primarily a kingdom leader. I'm not even primarily Amy's husband or Alicia and Landon's dad. I'm not primarily friend to everybody here. My identity, and it took a minute to get here, but I can tell you, my identity is Jeff, a son of God. Yes. I'm a son. And when you come to that place where you're, you, you recognize you're a daughter who he loves, yep, he knows your history and he loves you without measure. You're a son. Yep, he knows your struggle and he loves you without measure. And that you're fully accepted in the beloved. If you're in Jesus, you're fully accepted by the Father. You're not working your way to acceptance. You were accepted the moment you said yes to Jesus. Fully accepted. Like you don't improve upon 100%. 
You live in response to that 100%, and that's why you, you, you end up finding out why you are. Who you are, son or daughter, but why? And man, that's what so many Christians are missing. That's my heart. If you want to know my heart in kingdom leadership, if God gave me enough years and, and the, the wisdom to do it, I would want every single one of you, and you watching, I would want every single one of you to know why you are. Because he gets so much glory from a person that is rooted in identity and committed to the right activity. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, it's the most fulfilling thing in the world. Um, I'm teaching a course at Caneo Ministry Training Center. I just started last week, and it's called Missional Unity. And our textbook is written by Francis Chan. How many of you know the name Francis Chan? Raise your hand. So Francis Chan was a pastor in Silicon Valley. Massive church, great, explosive results, fruit, tons of money. Probably one of the wealthiest churches anywhere in the United States of America. And some years ago, after all of this success, Francis Chan gets in a season where he's hearing from the Lord and he's saying to himself, I don't want to do this. This isn't who I am. And he walks away from what most pastors are clamoring to walk into. And he walks away and he starts living in third world countries, going neighborhood to neighborhood, village to village, dirt road to dirt road, telling people about Jesus so they can believe. Why? What happened? He figured out why he was. So they fasted and they prayed. And then it says they laid their hands on them, verse three, and sent them off. So the church here is said to have sent off these two men. And just one more verse, you're going to find out that it says the Holy Spirit sent them off. Well, which one was it? It's both. See, this is the way it works, and this is the way it'll work here. It's just the way God does things. When people do life together, when they commit their hand to the plow and they don't look back, when they say, I know who I am, and I'm, I'm confident God's going to show me why I am, and this is a season, this is the place, this church, this assembly, this faith family, I'm going to give it my best yes. And as you begin doing life together, then leaders that are existing in this house, and even if they don't have a position of leadership, but people of discernment, they look and they see, and it's just, this is the way it works, and this is true, Roger. God will literally just elevate people. Not people who want to be elevated, by the way. Because when you want to be elevated, you get de-escalated. But when, when, when you just are like, I'm happy in Jesus, I'm going to do something for the Lord, what can I do? The Lord starts just elevating people and your leaders will see it. Holy Spirit will be able to say, these are the right ones. And then the church comes in to affirm what the Holy Spirit originates. See, we don't originate anything on our own. I've done a lot of that in ministry and it never works. But when the Holy Spirit originates it and we see it and affirm it and say, give our yes to it, this is what it looks like. They laid their hands on them and sent them off. Last two verses. So being sent out, this is my fourth point, my final point. They began the initial work of establishing kingdom outposts. Remember, up to this point, it's just an amazing church at Antioch. Lots of people getting saved. Different diversity. Leaders, they got prophets, they got teachers. Now they got apostolic leadership with Barnabas and Saul coming in. I mean, God's moving. Church has been growing for years. But they're, they're, they're just basically doing what the same thing the Jerusalem church did. They just stayed at the home base. That's the problem. The problem is we see God doing something great and we like, we want more of it to come here. More people, bigger buildings, more resources, better musicians, better singers, better preachers, a better welcome, a better kids ministry, a better youth ministry. Let's just get as much of it here as we can and we, we bloat. We just blow. And the pattern in the New Testament is keep making a healthy home base. That never goes away. It's not either or, it's and both. The healthy home base is really the pot in which God cooks all the stuff that he wants to export. And so there they are now for the first time, God's saying, okay, all of the DNA at Antioch, I'm sending you out from in-home to outpost. So verse number four, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. They arrived at Salamis. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. 
and they had John to assist them. So there you have Paul's first missionary journey. Paul, Barnabas, John Mark, who ends up not being able to cut it, he quits, um, causes a little division later on, but um, this, this renegade team goes out. So li- listen to this, I'm almost done. The Antioch church with zero formal training. They had no experience in planting kingdom outposts, but they began the work by prayer-born faith. They prayed and God started moving. They got on their faces, they fasted, they sought God. We don't even know that they were saying God sent us. We have no idea what they were praying, but their consecration and prayer and fasting created an atmosphere which not only did God speak, but they could hear him. God is speaking. The question or not is whether or not we're hearing. And so they did all of this and they sent forth their best two, their top two leaders, to begin the work of planting outposts. And so, from the very simple beginning that we're reading about today, Paul would eventually plant no fewer than 14 different outposts, kingdom outposts. No fewer than 14. Some people think many, many more than that, but we have at least 14 we can count. And it took three separate mission journeys for him to do that. But here's what I want to get to. From this moment in the history of the Antioch church, the gospel of Christ began to shake the world. It wasn't enough for Jerusalem to be thriving and Antioch to be thriving. Jesus said, go ye into all the world. Go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so when we think about that, we can like hear the the triumphant trumpet, dun, dun, dun. It wasn't that impressive. It it wasn't like over-orchestrated. It was a prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit says, you too. What are we gonna do with them, Lord? Keep fasting and praying and I'll tell you. Okay, and a little bit later on, I want you to begin to go and I want you to begin to plant churches. And from that, the word of God spread, the gospel of Jesus spread, even unto the land in which you heard the gospel. See, none of this is disconnected from your own life. All of this has a bearing on who we are and what we're doing. And I just want to ask us this. Do you feel, can you, even if it's a mustard seed, do you feel a little bit of the pull that says, how can I who has received so much not give my best yes to making, creating, being a part of a church that does this same thing out there for others. That's where I'm at. I'm at a place where I'm, I'm, I can't just take satisfaction in awesome church services and great family. There's a mission and it's time. So three things, because I I figure I owe you an explanation about this word outpost. What's an outpost? Why do I use that? Jeff, we don't know that term. That's not what I learned ever. (laughs) Did you make that up? Not really, but we just don't use it, and I'm thinking we should. So an outpost, there's a military application to it. It describes a detachment of troops stationed at a distance from the main force or formation, and they're usually positioned in a remote or sparsely populated location. Jerusalem was the main out, the main hub. Antioch was an outpost, and Antioch as an outpost is now going to plant outpost away from the main hub. There's also a border outpost definition. It's an outpost maintained by a sovereign state along its border, usually one of a series of outposts, placed at regular intervals to watch over and safeguard its border with a neighboring state. So in other words, when you're thinking about the outpost on the border, it means you're you're literally taking who you are and moving it further, both to advance and to protect. And when I'm thinking about the land, the region that we're in, I'm seeing in my spirit from this house, outposts that we plant in very, I spent 30 minutes this morning just looking at a map of about 40 miles around this church and all these city names started leaping up at me. 
And I'm like, I don't, I can't tell you dogmatically. It was the Lord saying, put a church here, put an outpost here, put an outpost here, and so on and so on. But all I can tell you is this, I'm stirred. By the way, you're thinking, man, that's going to be expensive. That's a lot of buildings. Who said anything about buildings? Who said anything about buildings? We have a home. We have a house. Like, oh man, I can feel it. Ooh, I'm going from teaching. I'm going to, ooh, mm. Like just some prophetic stirring right now. Like what if you were trained and equipped along with four other people and you five, maybe an apostolic leader, maybe a prophetic leader, maybe an evangelistic leader, maybe a shepherding leader, maybe a teaching leader, were raised up and equipped over nine months here and we said, we want you because one of you lives in Watkinsville. We want you to start an outpost over there. We're still going to be your covering. We're still going to be your family. We're going to still sow into it. We will help. But you don't need a 25,000 square foot building to do something for Jesus. You need a home and a neighborhood full of people that don't know him. And that's the kind of things that we're talking about. So all of a sudden, it's less about the guy on a platform. You don't need a bishop's collar. You don't need an ordination. You need a heart that is consecrated, prayerful. You need a covering, some equipping, and you need an urge within your spirit that says, how can we do this for the glory of God? And then finally, worship team, y'all come on up. Please. A pioneer outpost, and this just speaks to me about our culture and who we are and why we're here. Pioneer Outpost is described as a wisely designed controlled habitat located in an environment inhospitable. I'll just say for Christians. And they describe ocean floor, Antarctic, in space, or another planet. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. The culture you're living in is not going to get more favorable to your beliefs. It's inhospitable. And it is a little bit like we're from another planet. Amen? If you're a friend with the world, you're at enmity with God. We are aliens. We are a peculiar people. Those are all Bible terms. And I'm sitting there thinking, what better way for us to be a welcoming, open-hearted, open-handed, just like extension of what God does. If you think about it this way, we're already an outpost because there's a great cloud of witnesses. Those are our people and we're here for a reason. And guys, what it just makes sense to me for an outpost to reproduce outposts wherever we go. And let's not leave it to, and I thank God for parachurch ministries. I love missions organizations. I thank God for them. But that that was actually not entrusted to them. Do you know why they rose up? because the church quit doing it. The church quit doing it, and so a bunch of Christians who believed in it, whose pastors wouldn't do it, said, well, let's create a board, and we'll just have to bypass the church. We'll create a mission board. We'll train them. We'll teach them. We'll equip them, and we'll send them. That was never God's design. God's design is that we would do that here. So how do I end a message like this? By asking you to stand to your feet.